Welcome to the 2018 Don Dunstan Oration. Uh, my name's David Pearson. and I'm the Executive Director of the Don Dunstan Foundation and I'd like to invite Tiana Bain to the stage to do an acknowledgement of country. Nā māni. Nāi nāi tiana purumba nanki baini, yaitu tendalu nalu gani atanga. Bamba, bambarendi, mani nalu tampendi, nalu gani atanga, imperendi. Nā chalia. How are you all? Do anyone understand what I just said? No? All right. Well, my name's Tiana Bain. My Ghana name is Puromba Nanki, which means the mother of Puromba. Emily Rose right there is my daughter, and her Ghana name's Puromba, which means flower. We would like to acknowledge this land that we meet on today as the traditional lands for the Ghana people. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, language and beliefs, as well as both elders past and present. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you so much for that. Welcome to country. I think today we've got a real treat in um, the speaker that we have before us, and, and I guess one of the heart of the topic of what um, Kat's going to talk about is innovation. And I always reflect when we have a welcome to country about what innovation means, and it doesn't always mean doing new things. It sometimes means learning old things that we've long forgotten, and we are so privileged to have in Australia the oldest living continuous culture in the world. And so something really important to reflect on when we have those welcomes to country that it is that we are today meeting on Ghana land and always was and always will be. Um, so, welcome. Uh, we've got uh, a fantastic speaker, as I was saying, but just before we start, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Kat Dunn, our C uh, the CEO of Grameen Australia, who is our speaker today. I'd like to welcome the uh, chief executives of the state government agencies, the representatives from PwC in the room, from Flinders University and from the University of Adelaide. Uh, these are organisations are partners of IPA and the Don Dunstan Foundation, and it's without their support we wouldn't be able to put on events like today, so just really wanted to acknowledge their support right off the bat. Uh, just in terms of a few housekeeping things, if you can make sure your phones are on silent, that's always really helpful. Uh, toilets are just outside, there's some drinks and food out there as well, so please make sure you had a bite to eat. Um, if there's an emergency, please follow any of the IPA staff and we will um, gladly help you to safety. Um, in terms of Kat's presentation, we'll be taking questions from the audience at the end, so please have a think of those. And also the presentation PowerPoint uh, will be available uh, tomorrow at some point um, on the IPA, Dunst IPA and Don Dunstan Foundation websites. So, um, the program today is in honour of um, our 35th Premier of South Australia, the Honourable Don Dunstan. He set a new direction for public administration that had, had far-reaching national implications. And shortly before his death, Don Dunstan, which is 20 years as of next February, um, Don Dunstan entrusted to the Institute of the Public Administration in South Australia, the key advocate for effective public administration, the honour ca of carriage of an annual Dunstan narration on public administration. And so I'm very pleased that today, IPA South Australia and the foundation established to perpetuate his memory and his legacy have again partnered in this event. Uh, and for those who don't know, the Dunstan Foundation, uh, we describe ourselves as a thought leadership organisation, so we work on collaborative projects uh, to inspire action for a fairer world and build on the legacy of Don Dunstan. We do a lot of work on homelessness, and I acknowledge many of the partners in our homelessness work through in the room today. Um, we do a lot of work on mental health, on migration, on Aboriginal economic empowerment, and um, the last one, sort of a rather big project we do, is on growing the purpose economy. And this kind of phrase, the purpose economy, is something that Kat, in fact, introduced me to and has been really helpful in the um, development of the work that we do through the Thinkers Program and really to take the economy that we have in South Australia and drive it and grow it to be more purposeful so that we can have the, mo the world's highest levels of cultural, social and environmental impact. And that's the, really the mission that we've got. I first met Kat um, when we brought um, Muhammad Yunus to South Australia earlier this year. He's the Nobel Prize winning economist um, who really pioneered this whole three zero approach that Kat's going to speak about. And Kat is, like Dr Eunice, um, somebody who's got some very big ideas and a very big passion and, um, for making the world a, bit of, a better place. Um, she's in fact really a force of nature and I'm so excited that she's here to share her thoughts with you today. And she, her work's been at the forefront of this whole zero, three zeros movement around the world and to offer her perspectives on how the community, the business community, um, so the community generally, the business community and the public sector can all work together to see a world of three zeros. Zero unemployment, zero net carbon emissions and zero poverty. And Kat will no doubt talk about the work that she's done with Mahmoud Yunus uh, over the years. And I'd just really like to acknowledge that as part of the visit we had early this year, we um, successful in getting not just one, but two Yunus social business centres off the ground. And I noticed some of our friends from the University of Adelaide who are here that are driving that work. And so incredibly excited that we have um, those centres getting established here in South Australia. 
So IPA understands, you might think, um, why is IPA, sorry, uh, engaged in an exercise in talking about social business and these three zeros. And I think it's really great that IPA understands the really important role that the public sector plays in supporting and driving innovation. And social business is right at the vanguard of the next big wave, I believe, in innovation that is sweeping the world. And South Australia has a long history of innovation, generally, but innovation in the public sector. Think Torrens title, um, a world-leading innovation and regulatory innovation that has driven so much value around the world, but started here in South Australia. And perhaps less well-known, the stump jump plough. Um, some people might think private sector innovation. Well, it was driven in 1876 by a public sector innovation challenge, something that um, IPA and the public sector in South Australia are doing a lot of work on innovation challenges. So. Um, Innovation in the private sector doesn't happen in a bubble. The public sector has an incredibly important role to play in driving um, and testing new ideas. And we see that right throughout our history. And today, um, or recently, we're sort of seeing new driverless vehicles being tested because of the regulatory environment that innovators in the public sector have driven to make sure that we can be that place that tests new ideas. So the public sector has a huge role in these things. And I encourage you to reflect, as Kat's talking tonight, about what role you can play in the work that you do, whether you work in the public sector, the private sector, or the community, about how we can bring around a world where we have zero net carbon emissions, zero poverty, and zero unemployment. But enough grandstanding from me. You're here to hear from Kat. Just a little bit of background on Kat. She um, started her career as a lawyer. I said to you earlier, we wouldn't hold that against you. Um, in 2013, she was appointed the lead of the regulated fund establishment team for Perpetual Corporate Trust. And in 18 months, she led over 40 deals with, fund, with total funds under management of in, in excess of $3 billion. In 2016, Kat was appointed the youngest executive to serve as senior leadership role of Perpetual Limited, charged with building the, ground, the group-wide um, continuous improvement program. She served on Perpetual's Diversity Council and was, and was awarded the CEO Mobius Award for Outstanding Client Leadership. She has advised industry and government bodies, including the Financial Services Council, the Commonwealth Treasury, the APEC Asian Region Funds Passport, the Australian Collective Investment Vehicles Regime, and most recently she served as the Chief Chief Operating Officer of a tech media company called Ideas Pod, which she which had which she grew the monthly readership to over five million. I told you she had lots of ideas and a driving passion. Um, she was also the creator of F Off Fear of Failure Forum. Um, and publicly advocates for the near need for Australia to overcome our fear of failure that stops us from innovating. Kat's passionate about empowering everyone, human beings, rich or poor, to grow their potential. Please join me in welcoming Kat to the stage. Thank you, David Irma, everyone. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> well, that was the question that I was first asked when I was three years old, and it was levelled at me by my mother, who had left everything that she knew in the Philippines to bring me up with my Australian father in country WA, where the air was cleaner and the professional opportunities more abundant. Or so I thought. You want to be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer? She answered her own question on my behalf. <laughs> and so I became a lawyer, as David said, and whether that was her shaping my destiny or running interference, we will never know. In the first two decades of my life, I absorbed two key ideas about work. First, that you had to get a job. And second, in that job, you could either be a greedy capitalist who made all of the money or a starving humanitarian who saved the world but you can't do both. And so for 10 years in my career, I made that trade-off. I was in corporate law and funds management, and I did that until I could make the trade-off no longer. Early last year, I quit my senior leadership job in an ASX-listed company without another one to go to. For my farewell gift, my group executive gave me this book, Oh, The Places You'll Go, by Dr. Zeus. <laughs> And a few months later, I was approached by Grameen Australia to become their Australian CEO. And at Grameen, I learned that that traditional narrative, that you had to choose between making a financial or a social return, was wrong. The most sustainable business models won't make you choose between the two. They will blend both. 
And so now I ask you, what if instead of having to make a trade-off between financial or social gain, you could blend both to make financial and social gain? And how, we do, how would we do something like this? Through this phenomenon, as David said, called social business, a business that's designed to solve human problems. And today we'll explore four types of social businesses. Firstly, a business that itself solves a social problem. Two, a business that employs its beneficiaries and then if they wish to create a customer market for them. Three, a business that has a subsidization model. And finally, a business that disrupts the incumbents and then beats them on social return. But first, let's talk about our favorite elephant in the room, capitalism. See, capitalism tends to work when you have capital, not so well if you don't. Capital tends to flow to business owners and job creators, but the majority of people are employees or job seekers. So that would mean that capitalism in its current form doesn't tend to work very well for the majority of people. Now, when a business has capital, it tends to deploy that capital to achieve a very specific and singular goal, profit maximization. But why is that the case? Because remember, at its core, the, a business is really only an organizing mechanism to achieve a concrete goal. But in our society, we've decided collectively that the only concrete goal worth organizing around is profit maximization. Indeed, we have even said and defined that shareholders' best interests is profit maximization. And so this creates this cultural and legal phenomenon where businesses either pursue financial return at the expense of social return, or they have to pursue a social return at the expense of a financial return and possible legal action from their shareholders. And what drives this fundamental belief is that we think the nature of the human being is inherently selfish that we only have selfish needs. But this is an incomplete view and it doesn't explain why people will issue lucrative careers to work in charities or in the public sector. And it doesn't explain why people will rally around millions of dollars to disaster relief campaigns halfway around the other side of the world and it doesn't explain random acts of kindness. Yes, human beings are selfish, but we're also selfless and everything in between. And yet there has been no capital raising vehicle to raise money for philanthropic, for altruistic, generous and compassionate ventures until now. What is a social business? It's simply a business that's designed to solve a human problem. Unlike charity, it must be revenue generating and capital can be returned to the investor up to 100%, but no more. But unlike a profit maximizing business, the profits must be reinvested to scale the impact of the business instead of being distributed to investors. Now, what does this actually mean? We often say that a charity dollar has one life, but a social business dollar has infinite lives. That's because a social business dollar will be invested not into a consumption, but an activity that is a business that generates revenue can help the operation break even and when it is cash flow positive, return capital to an investor and eventually fund its own expansion. What happens then is the investor is able to either reinvest their social business dollar back into the social business or invest it in another social business scaling their impact ever more. So this original donation is leveraged over and over again as the profits from the venture keep getting recycled into the business. Now, how is it funded? In the seed, scale, and startup scale-up phases, it is funded by philanthropic capital, but then afterwards it can fund its own expansion. And with the advent of social business, we can usher in a new kind of capitalism that values altruism and generosity as much as it does financial gain. And in doing so, create a world of three zeros, zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero net carbon emissions, which is the vision of Professor Muhammad Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank, and the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize winner. So let's go to the first example. A business that actually itself solves a social problem. 
In the mid-1970s, a man named Yunus worked at Chittagong University at the height of the Bangladeshi Revolution. Inside the university, he taught traditional economics, but when he walked outside, he would see people dying in the streets. And it looked like the economics that he was teaching didn't really have any meaningful practical applications for them. There was clearly a difference between what he was teaching and how it worked. And he wanted to know what the problem was. When he talked to locals, he found out that there were no jobs in the economy and they couldn't access capital to run their businesses. And why was that? Because they had no asset collateral. And so they were forced to go to loan sharks who would charge exorbitant interest rates. Just enough for them to be able to pay the loan shark back, but never enough for them to break out of the cycle. So if the problem was poverty and access to capital, the way he decided to try and solve this was to lend people some money and see what would happen to that. He lent initially $27 between 42 women and he said, I trust you. Even though you have no asset collateral, I trust that you will pay me back this money. And they did at rates of 100%. He kept repeating this experiment in his village and he found that the experiment eventually became Grameen Bank. It has since issued over $27 billion worth of loans to over 9 million people. And in 2006, Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize. So the solution is Professor Yunus gave excluded entrepreneurs enough credit through something called group lending. He says that poverty is not created by the poor, but the systems that we design for ourselves. So instead, he made a system that unlocked people's potential. How did he do this? Well, firstly, instead of protecting against credit risk, he designed to unlock credit potential. Instead of penalising people with the threat of taking their assets if they default, he incentivised them to repay. Something called social collateral instead of asset collateral. He lent to a group of people instead of just one person. And in doing so, he incentivised them to pay back because if they didn't, they would let the team down. And it also minimised their risk of not repaying. Secondly, instead of paying in a lump sum after a long period of time, they would pay in weekly instalments, principal, interest and savings, growing their wealth, practicing growing their wealth, and eventually building up a credit score. At their weekly meetings, and this is the third thing, they get training and mentoring. In Grameen Australia, Philippines, we have a program called the SYOB, Start Your Own Business Program. So every week, not only do they repay, but they learn financial and business literacy as well. And then finally, and most importantly, the group subscribes to something called an SDA, a social development agenda, which influences the women to have discipline and accountability. So unlike a traditional bank, it is truly a social transformation process. And it increases the social and political consciousness of the newly organized groups. It's the antithesis of traditional banking. So whilst the clients of conventional banks are typically capital rich men, the client base of Grameen is overwhelmingly capital poor women. Whilst conventional banks like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns collapsed under the weight of the GFC, the worldwide repayment rates of capital poor mothers in developing countries remain steady at 97%. And so what's the revenue model here? It's interest. The program becomes viable because it charges a reasonable amount of interest. And it, it, in Philippines, the interest rate's 1%. In Grameen America, the interest rate is 10%, which is slightly higher than usual working capital, not only to fund the operating capital costs of the operation, but also to fund the training and mentoring and social development process as well. Why do we need a Grameen intervention here? How can something like this apply in Australia, we often get asked. Now, people sometimes say that microfinance cannot work in a developed country. Well, in 2008, at the height of the GFC, Grameen America was born. And in the 10 years since, it has issued a billion dollars worth of loans to over 100,000 women with a repayment rate of about 99.98%. And 10 years on, set against the backdrop of the Banking Royal Commission, Grameen Australia has been asked by uh, communities in New South Wales and Victoria to try the intervention here. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we do need an intervention here. 
Despite two decades of unbroken economic growth spurred by a mining boom and high levels of education, 17% of Aussies of working age are still financially excluded, and most of them are women. Now, what does this mean? It has implications not just for personal fulfillment, but systemic implications. From the perspective of housing, health, education, and domestic relationships. If a Grameen style of microfinance is set up in areas of social disadvantage, it can empower people at a systemic level. How? Well, one, it promotes a hand up, not a handout. Two, generates jobs and self-employment and hiring others as the entrepreneurial businesses scale, which generates new income and business taxes, increasing government revenue. It will privatise individual superannuation, which reduces the burden on the public pension scheme. And it stimulates household income, which incre increases the likelihood that kids get educated and contribute to community. It means that by increasing taxes and decreasing the reliance on the public pension scheme, we are better able to fund an ageing population. It realises the creative and entrepreneurial talents of a disenfranchised yet talented population, which increases personal and collective fulfilment, which decreases the burden on the healthcare system. It strategically empowers entrepreneurial mothers and unlocks participants in an underutilised population which realises new GDP and has positive family outcomes. And we optimise for an economically and socially inclusive system in which all humans and Australians lead dignified, meaningful lives where everyone gets to contribute to society. Who wouldn't want that to apply in Australia? No, not only does that appeal to the national anthem of jobs and growth, but it does so for a reason, unlocking people's human potential, which is very distinct from reducing people to a job. Professor Eunice often says that the problem of unemployment is arising from the fiction of employment, because one of the messages that we get told at school is that we need to get a job. Our schools and universities boast about making us job ready. When we have a job, people ask us, how's your job going? If we don't have a job, people ask us, how's your job hunt going? We spend so much of our precious lives working and talking about work, is it any wonder we're experiencing ever-increasing levels of anxiety fueled by a feel of imminent technological unemployment? But human beings are so much more than just jobs. They're more than square pegs to be slotted into square holes to do square tasks so that they can afford three square meals a day. They're creative, expansive and full of potential. Yet they can only realise that potential if the environment permits them to do that. Professor Yunus believes that all humans are born entrepreneurs. So instead of teaching our kids to be job ready, why don't we teach them to be life ready? And this is where tools like microfinance and social business come in to help them unlock things like their creative potential. To offer an alternative way to make a living when jobs are scarce, safety nets non-existent, and yet the human desire to self-actualise, indomitable. Now, my second example of a social business is a business that employs people in it as well as creates a customer for the entrepreneurs. And speaking of indomitable, this is Sal. She's a Khmer woman from the Samarit province, and at eight years old, she lost an eye. Her father was disabled in a landmine, and because of the stigma, he started drinking and becoming violent and hit Sal when she was a young girl so hard that her eye had to be removed. It catapulted their family into poverty and she ended up from the age of 10 years old having to work on the local rubbish dump, scavenging for um, plastics and rice that she would then sell at the end of the day for $1.50 a day for her and her whole family. When we first met Sal, we asked her how she was going and she said that her life felt hopeless. This is Sal now. She's 23 years old. In 2013, we recruited her into the Grameen Australia Chicken Training Centre where she was able to learn how to operate a commercial rearing poultry farm. She's young and determined to escape the poverty of her life and she has since been promoted to being the co-assistant deputy farm manager earning $200 a month, which is four times more than she was making before. The problem in this scenario is extreme poverty, malnutrition and food security, 
But with the f support of key local families, we were able to find a solution that involved harnessing the Khmer chickens that were already in the community and organizing them so that they could be sold into the booming Cambodian tourism market. With the revenue stream being what we were selling the chickens for in the market. And in fact, this actually leads to the more innovative uh, social business opportunity, which is the phase two of the chicken farm. In order to scale the farm, instead of hoarding operations internally by ourselves, we're creating a village grower program where we build a second farm that lays chicks, that chickens that lay eggs, sell the eggs to village growers who, with our practices, will be able to rear the chickens and then distribute them into the Cambodian market that we have created for them. This is a model that Grameen Australia believes can be scaled throughout all of Cambodia, which fundamentally restructures the poultry industry. Now, the third example of a social business model is one that creates a product that has two pricing tiers, where one subsidizes the other. The year was 2005 when Professor Yunus went to a conference in France and he was introduced to a man by the name of Frank Riboud who happened to be the chairman of Group Danone, the $45 billion French food company. Uh, Frank asked Professor Yunus what was the biggest problem he was facing at the time and he said, well, the malnutrition and stunted growth of children in developing countries. Frank said, well, I have a food company, you have a malnutrition program, is there any way that we can join forces to solve this problem? And so they did. They decided to create a yogurt that was packed so high in nutrition that only two serves would uh, satisfy the nutritional needs of these children in developing countries. But what they did was they created two pricing models. One for urban uh, consumers who were able to pay a higher amount and another that was a lower price for village consumers that were unable to pay the same amount. And in addition, Danone would enlist the help of mothers to advocate for the product in the village, which saved on their distribution and marketing costs. Now, Danone agreed that this joint venture would be a social business, and that means that the shareholders weren't able to get a return. They agreed to this, but they said, well, we don't know how we're going to do this because shareholders have to get a return under our legal regime. We'll run a meeting, but we can't guarantee that it will work. In the end, when they ran this meeting, 98% of the shareholders said that they did want to invest in a social business without any dividends, and they ended up raising accidentally $35 million. Now, this led to the unfortunate, unintended consequence of the employees becoming outraged for why were they not offered the opportunity to invest in the social business as well. And so they had to run another special general meeting, and in that meeting raised $30 million. The joint venture was called Grameen Danone Foods Limited, and in 2015 it broke even and it is on track for viability in 2019. So in this case, the problem was childhood mal malnutrition. They solved it by creating a high nutrition food product and sold it into a market and subsidized the lower priced product with a higher priced product because they sold to two different markets with two different price sensitivities. Now, my fourth and final example of a social business is one that's close to home. It's a it's social business that disrupts an incumbent market and then beats them on price product and social return. Humanitics was co-founded by Sydney gentlemen Adam McCurdy and Josh Ross. They've been best friends since high school. Um, when they went on a trip to Kashmir, they realized that they wanted to do more with their lives uh, and contribute to humanity. Being young professionals, they wanted to imagine a better use of their commercial skills because Adam was a management consultant at Accenture with an engineering and a maths background and Josh had made partner at a hedge fund uh, at the age of 26. They wanted to be able to deploy their commercial acumen for good instead of evil. Their first idea was to create a social network where they could redeploy the advertising funds into uh, advertising fees into charities. But then they realized they probably couldn't compete against the likes of Facebook, so they pivoted quickly and decided to create a ticketing platform disrupting the ticketing incumbents. And so that's how Humanitics was born. Humanitics is the world's first not-for-profit ticketing platform. 
In 2016, Adam quit his job to start on Humanitics full-time and they shared Josh's salary for a year. And in 2017, Josh quit his job and worked at Humanitics full-time. In their first year, they took $2 million worth of revenue through the platform and distributed $80,000 to charity. So 100% of the revenue of their profits from the booking fees goes to a charity of the event organizer's choice instead of going back to the shareholders, which are Adam and Josh predominantly. The problem here is that the ticket industry is mature and event organizers and guests resent booking fees. And there's also no real opportunity to connect an event with a social cause, which is a missed marketing opportunity for event organizers. So the solution was to build this ticketing platform that offers exactly the same service as the incumbent, except beats them on social return. And the revenue is earned through the booking fees, of which 100% of the profits are redirected to the charity ecosystem. So we've heard about four examples of social business. You have a business that solves for a social problem itself, a business that employs its beneficiaries or creates a market for them, a subsidization model, and a business that disrupts an incumbent and then beats it on social turn. And in each of these examples, we see that there are financial returns as there's inbuilt revenue that can sustain the business to eventually fund its own expansion. And it removes the need to exclusively keep going after grants um, once the, the funding once the viability of the project is reached. And interestingly, um, as an aside, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, because of their mandatory savings model, has now accumulated more deposits in the bank than it has uh, that it lends out. So the Grameen borrowers, the women who were previously declined by all the traditional banks, have now become Grameen lenders. And in each of these examples, we've also seen that the business has a social return because the design of it is to solve a human problem, whether it's poverty, financial exclusion, malnutrition, food insecurity, or creating a new distribution model, distribution channel for a charity ecosystem. This shatters the idea that business cannot be deployed to solve a social solution, and it shatters the myth that capital will never flow to an operation born out of generosity, compassion, and love. So where does Grameen Australia fit in with all of this? Well, we're a wholly owned Australian entity that has been an active in our current form for about the last four years, and we have ties with the Unis Centre in Bangladesh. However, we're independent of them. Our vision is to create a financially and socially inclusive world in which all humans lead dignified, meaningful lives, and in doing so, to help to usher in a world of three zeros. Our projects are in microfinance in the Philippines, the chicken farm in Cambodia, and we're exploring bringing an Australian microfinance program to Australia as well. By the year 2020, through developing and growing social business, we aim to have created 50,000 jobs, of which 40,000 are through self-employment, to materially increase the household income of 40,000 families, to transform the lives of 200,000 people, and to bring in new GDP to 50 communities. And we're doing this by pairing a business approach to purposeful goals. And now many of you will have the Grameen postcard in your books, and I invite, invite you all to join the movement because you can fill them out and leave them on your chair. And perhaps even the very first order of business will be very, may very well be to create two financial systems. One for the capital rich, and one for the capital poor. Because currently what we have is a, a financial system that caters for the needs of the capital rich. In this system, to get a loan, you basically need to convince the bank that you don't need the loan. To qualify for the loan, you need to prove that you either have asset collateral, strong enough networks and relationships that somebody will guarantor you, or a track record of recurring earnings to prove the strength of your financial position. If you cannot prove to the banks that you have these safeguards in place, if in fact you are someone who genuinely needs a loan, then you are prohibited from getting a loan and scorned for needing it in the first place, branded with the dehumanizing label of being uncreditworthy. Can you imagine what's going to happen to all the people on the brink of financial exclusion in the aftermath of the Banking Royal Commission? In this perverse paradigm, we have a paradigm where capital-rich people can lend money to each other, 
exclude capital poor people from their system except for when they want to exploit them by charging them fees for services that they never rendered. And then externalizing the consequences of their system failure to the very people that they denied to be in their system in the first place. We currently use a capital rich framework to assess the credit worthiness of the capital poor. But they are already at the floor. There's no point assessing against their credit risk. But how can they have credit risk? You can't give them any credit. So instead of protecting against the credit risk, the system should be designed to unlock their credit potential. Assessing capital poor people by the credit standards of the capital rich is like enlisting fish in a running race and concluding that any complications signals the fish's own ineptitude. Different conditions require different conditions. Two cap two financial systems, one for the capital rich and one for the capital poor. So this ensures that the capital poor mothers are protected from the credit risks of the capital rich. Professor Yunus dedicates his book to the young generation who will build a new civilization. And when I look at this, I don't think it is a narrow reference to youth, but a reference to fresh thinking on the part of everybody, irrespective of their age as public servants at the helm of the good ship Australia. You can captain its destiny to the shores of good fortune and welcome its people to a world of zero poverty, zero unemployment and zero net carbon emissions. And when you get to that shore, may you build a very tall, very bright beacon of hope for the generations to follow. And to go one step further, what the purveyors of dominant wisdom don't tell you is that you could always do this. Because fellow citizens, it is not enough to build a new system. You need to believe in what you're building. As Einstein said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Silicon Valley tech unicorns keep obsessing about scaling technology or user base. But in the business that you're in, nation building, the only thing that you need to worry about scaling is your character and spirit because you're not designing a website, you're designing a civilization. Our current civilization is built on a capitalist model that at its core believes people are selfish and helpless and designs around that belief. Well, I believe that people have unlimited potential given the right environment, so I would urge all of us to design around that belief. I would like to close by proposing an amendment to the question that my mother posed to me. Instead of asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? We should be asking our children, how do you want to be when you grow up? As in, show me your character, because it's important. Indeed, you only ever experience the world through the lens of your own character. So turn the brightness on that thing up full vol. If there is one thing you take away from today, let it be this. The only thing preventing us from creating the world of our dreams is our imagination. So imagine big, imagine bold, imagine a world of three zeros, and imagine that we can bring such a world about together. Oh, I'm told that I'm to ask the room if there are questions. Hello. I have a microphone. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, my question is around uh, Aboriginal communities in Australia, and, and I think it's probably a, a fairly, uh, <laughs> fairly obvious target mm -hmm. uh, when we're looking at raising uh, a social justice and a social equity um, stake here. I'd be interested to know what Grameen's uh, focus vision plans are in that space. Mm. Well, and what we were, we're currently in the middle of doing a business case to bring the Grameen style of microfinance to Australia and we're looking at the demographics that that would um, most suit. And of course we had to look at Indigenous people. It's really important when dealing with something that complex and that important that you know what you're doing. And for us, our core is migrant women in a developing and developing and in developed nations. So our starting position here would be looking at that demographic, migrant women. However, what we have 
what we can foresee could be possible is once we do a pilot and we adjust for the Australian conditions, is there a way to tranche very carefully our learnings from one demographic into others? So, youth, people with certain abilities, the disabilities, or even Indigenous populations. But we'd be doing it in a very careful way in conjunction with the people who are um, impacted because we know it's quite a complex space. The other people that we would say we take inspiration from are many rivers. So they're another microfinance organisation that's supported by Westpac and I think 47% of their loans um, are to Indigenous communities and businesses and people. So um, we know that they do things quite well and if we were to do something in Australia, we'd certainly um, maybe you know, partner or, or, or look to them for inspiration. Hello, Ruth Hello. Russell. You said your focus was on migrant women and my mind immediately went back to all the migrant women in the early days in Melbourne, working for hours and hours, uh, sewing, making shoes in the slums of Melbourne, yeah. not getting paid a wage. Yeah. What do you see? Uh, do you have a minimum wage for your workers, hours, conditions, superannuation? I mean, they're all things about employment that are essential for families. It's not just what you get at the end of the day. There are a lot of other things as well. So I'd just like to see exactly what would migrant... How do you repay migrant women? Thanks. Thank you for your question, Ruth. I'm so glad you said Melbourne because we're actually working with the team in Broadmeadows and the city of Hume. There's 22% unemployment in Broadmeadows and I've got 160 or so nations represented. I think there's a distinction when you think about microfinance, microfinance for working capital for businesses. So the women that we would be working with wouldn't be employees unless they self-employed and employed other women. And so the conditions that you're talking about um, are more akin to an environment where it's a business that has employees and needs to treat them in a particular way, which of course we advocate for. Uh, with the microfinance programs, it's not consumer work, it's not consumer capital, but it's working capital so that they're able to buy materials and scale their businesses. Businesses like uh, trade businesses, so cleaning or catering or um, salons, uh, things that can, a small loan can go a very long way. But within those, it's interesting because there's seven principles of social business being financially viable. Uh, the, the fifth one is actually, um, the same or better than working conditions to market. And we also say that there's a bias towards ensuring that you have um, a focus on women and gender equality. And also any business that you create has to have, um, uh, doesn't, at a floor, doesn't damage the environment, but ideally replenishes it as well. So in a business, the women would be buying their, the women would be generating their own profits and paying their own wages. So they'd be able to set their wages that they give to themselves. Mm. And that's, yeah, that's a matter for the private business to determine for itself. Yep. Thank you for coming all the way over here. Just for me, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. I want to talk about um, investment. Mm -hmm. And I'm going back about 10 years when I was looking at my superannuation, as we all have. And uh, I was going through the university superannuation scheme. We were given options. And there was an option that was a pretty easy one. You know, get out of armaments, get out of, t <coughs> out of tobacco and some other uh, particular products. And then about five years ago, they offered another sustainable um, income stream, which meant getting out of fossil fuels, uh, alcohol, and uh, two or three others. So I ticked that particular box. And then speaking about two years or three years later, someone said, you're going backwards. Now, there's this general feeling that if we go heavily into the sustainable products mm -hmm. in terms of investments, then economically you're not going to survive. Tell me why that's incorrect. I think the question is over what time horizon? Mm. I'm looking at short term and long term. It's a... It's a Good question, and it's one of. I think we can we can safely say that in a declining industry like fossil fuels, that the returns will end at completely. In sustainable, I guess the philosophy with sustainable investments, and by the way, a Grameen investment 
a lot of people would say it's not investment grade because the people that you'd be talking to in impact investment want 10 times returns. Something like this takes a long time to even get to viability, let alone having to return the amount of interest, which is a small annuity for um, uh, usually a very conservative investor that wanted something stable over time and not a huge amount of growth. So I think that's the first point. Um, and I think the answer to that is how can you guarantee the sustainability of the investment over time? It wouldn't, you wouldn't make the analysis on the basis of what, what a suite or other investments were doing. You would look at it based on the performance of the business itself, its intention and its ability to create value for its customers. Um, and that is, it tends to be agnostic of its competitors. One of the things that I like to use as a philosophy when analyzing businesses, not that I'm a fund manager, is something called the theory, the game theory. There's this thing called a finite game and the infinite game. In the finite game, you know the rules, you know the players, and the purpose of the game is to win. In the infinite game, the rules are set, but the players are interchangeable, and the purpose of the game is to stay in the game. And this is something that Simon Sinek talks about the, the man who writes uh, Start With Why. And he says that the example of a finite game would be a competitive game like soccer. You know that you have to win, you know what the rules are and you know who the players are. But the example of the infinite game would be something like business. Players come and go and the purpose of the game is to stay in the game. And you can tell when that the the game goes out of equilibrium when a finite player plays an infinite player. When finite players play each other, it's in equilibrium. Infinite players play each other, it's in equilibrium. And he sees this with businesses who compete against each other and he can tell when one is playing the finite game or one is playing the infinite game because if you've got a Microsoft, they tend to shop and change their strategy depending on what Apple does. So they're looking at the here and now competition trying to beat it and always trying to game what they do on the basis of what someone else is doing. But someone like an Apple has a vision a vision external to themselves. And instead of trying to beat the internal comp external competition, they're constantly trying to beat themselves. And they are an organization that wants to stay in the game and they have a broader purpose. When you're looking at businesses that try to quantify the here and now returns, in inherently measuring an infinite business is quite hard because it's intangible, things like goodwill, it's quite hard to measure. Finite businesses is very easy to measure. You've got winning, uh, you have quarterly profits, you have attrition, you have share price, and those are things that are quite easy to measure. But that also tends to signal that they're in a paradigm where they want to win. But the question is, do you want to win the here and now game or do you want to stay in the game for a long time? And so when I'm analysing a business or I'm analysing an opportunity, I look at the signals that they're playing a much more infinite game and trying to contribute to a broader part of society because they're connected to something bigger than the here and now and are looking to actually forge uh, a landscape in which they are going to be part of the value creators and bring their investors along with them. I can send you the article, actually. <laughs> Hi, Callum Hello. from Scotch College. Um, just a question around uh, whether Grameen is looking at uh, tapping into the, the youth unemployment that we're seeing. Uh, you know, it's about double uh, the average unemployment for the country. Oh. Um, and as a second part to the question, um, how does Grameen deal with kind of the, the cultural issues around um, the reasons why people perhaps aren't working? I, mean, I think if you've got a super focused migrant worker who just can't get a job, mm. she's, that, that's perfect. But what about where well, there's more complex things such as, you know, family of origin issues, um, mental health, you know, how do you kind of def uh, work your way through some of the more complex issues around potential, uh, potential workers? Mm. Well, when we were in Grafton, New South Wales, actually, they were one of the regions that asked us to come to Australia. We went to a neighbourhood centre and it was really apparent that one of the opportunities there was to be able to give access to capital to some of the really entrepreneurial young people that were otherwise um, not get going to Sydney to get jobs but otherwise also couldn't find jobs in Grafton. Um, and there was you know, other side effects of that phenomena like isolation, disconnection and, um, uh, and delinquent activity. In terms of whether we would go there first, as I said before, we'd need to make sure that the model was right before we tranched it into different areas. But as part of the pilot, you could very well also uh, galvanise different groups of people and just test how well it works there. So that's 
one comment that I'd have. And uh, in terms of why people don't get jobs, I think, well, it's a complicated beast. So you have a phenomena where there aren't, uh, where jobs are reducing in an area already. So you have poverty already, and then you have the existing jobs that are there getting extinguished. Um, it's quite difficult for people to find a job in an area where there are none. And in terms of family of origin issues, I'm not a psychologist or a systems thinker in that perspective, but one of our principles at Grameen is absolutely social cohesion and bonding. That's why for us the most important thing is to be able to have group chemistry when we organise the groups and the people um, tend to vouch for each other. Because when you don't have assets to signal your potential, you need friends and you need to have been in that, you know, for example... I know that Mary has been in the area because I've seen her at church for the past five years. Uh, I don't know what her financial position is, but I know she's reliable because I see her do these things consistently. By being able to forge those groups um, and offer people a sense of belonging and a sense of social cohesion, then that tends to unlock uh, some of the latent creativity that they otherwise can't express in things like jobs. Um, so I hope that answers your question to some extent. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering why the um, focus seems to be so much on women when we really have a situation, particularly in, in youth, um, with, with very high male unemployment where um, males are now doing much worse educationally. Um, they're much higher risk of, of suicide. A lot of it's to do with, um, with loss of um, employment and, and jobs. Often they're a bit higher in terms of mental health issues. So it seems to be we seem to have lots and lots of programs out there that are focusing on, on women mm -hmm. um, and they seem to get a lot of sympathy and yet there doesn't seem to be much out there for, for blokes. Hmm. Well, I agree completely. Um, and I think the important thing about any intervention that is in the market is that you play to your strengths so that you can succeed. Um, one of the risks of Grameen, and I'm, and by the way, I'm not saying this would we would be precluded from being able to enter other markets or be able to offer interventions to other um, demographics. But in terms of a starting point, our rationale is that we just need to show that it works here, and the best place to start with is what we know. And if we've got a core uh, in other jurisdictions, and uh, for example, in Grameen America or Grameen Australia Philippines, then let's try with that core group of people in Australia first to make sure it does work. One of the risks of going somewhere where we're not competent, um, where we don't have a track record, is that we fail, not because the model doesn't work, but because we don't have the core competency in that demographic. And so I think what's a really sharper way of being able to extend our opportunities to other demographics is to get it right first and then tranche how we deliver it. Oh, and by the way, we did start with men, 50-50 men and women in Bangladesh. Uh, it just so happened that the loans just kept getting repaid through the women more so. And being commercial, we just went where the market was. And so the number of borrowers worldwide is 97% women. We do want to include more and more men, um, but that's just how the data, sort of the numbers fell. It's just ringing concern to me. I suppose, uh, will these businesses be able to, will they comply with all labour laws like OCK Health and Safety, set minimum wages and all the benefits of employment like sick leave and things like that? What happens if they get RSI because they work for so many hours and what happens? Because that often happens with women. They just get burnt out. They'll work for, you know, $5 an hour for hours and hours and hours and then they get RSI and they're on the scrap heap for the rest of their life. Mm. Are you, would you, will this be guaranteed to cover all the labour laws, protect employees and workers? Mm. Uh, and that's a really good point because that's something that we ask all, all the time to larger businesses. I think it's important to make a distinction between big business and microenterprise. When we talk about microenterprise, it's me, Kat Zan, with the vacuum cleaner going to someone's house. Um, and so I'm employing myself in that. And what I would normally do is I might have another job. I might be a nurse as well. Um, and my husband might be in construction. Um, and I want to top up my income. And the only way to do that is to get another job in another big business that may not treat me that well. Or I can uh, leverage my entrepreneurial spirit, which 
you know, I might be wanting to do already and get access to working capital so that I can be able to leverage my skills in that way. And so when we're talking about micro enterprise and employees, it's one person in one business that funds themselves. And maybe when they get enough scale, they can hire sort of, you know, two more people as well. So that, that would be a good thing. But um, it's not at the scale, um, I think, that larger businesses operate at. Not, yeah, it's much more smaller. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess in, in business, in your own business, the labor laws would, it's a distinct, I'm not an employment lawyer, but like it's a distinct category. And you'd absolutely, if you are hiring somebody else, as well as yourself, absolutely have to comply. But if it's just you, then it's just, yeah. As an entrepreneur? Absolutely, the way that you normally would in any small business. But um, it's because you have full control, it's your business. Yeah. Mm. Oh, you would have to have insurance in your own business if it was a particular scale, but some of these are quite, quite small. In terms of workplace cover? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You would take out, yeah, exactly, your own insurance, that's... Exactly, as, as you would in an ordinary business. Yeah. Hi there, Margie Faye from Uniting SA. Um, I'm just wondering about um, any advice that you might have. I'm thinking about um, social and community problems mm -hmm. and that people who um, spend a lot of time working in the community are probably really well um, positioned to be um, aware of some of the challenges and issues and problems. Mm -hmm but often might not have the um, networks and um, knowledge around business to be able to draw together the problem and the business solution. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in your thinking or advice um, around how to better make those connections so that some of those people who are really well positioned and, and might spend lots of their time pondering some of these problems um, can get access to some really good business advice to help mm. them realise solutions absolutely and I think that thank you for that question because uh, that lets me uh, talk about the unit centers because one of the things that we really want to do worldwide is be able to connect people to the social business movement and to each other to fund it um, out of these hubs which are the unit centers so there's a real opportunity for um, minds in different domains to collide there but also one of the things that we've experimented with recently is um, to actually use go through a process of teaching social business how to create one. We've just launched a social business masterclass recently and we can go through a process of being able to identify what it is that is the solution to a problem and then how can that generate a revenue by adopting a business approach rather than a handout approach. So that's a particular process. Um, one of the things Grameen Australia will want to be doing next year is launching more of these social business masterclasses. So if we do launch something like that in an online form, we'd absolutely be inviting people to come along and start to, um, yeah, incorporate some of that thinking into their own organisations. Um, but in the meantime, absolutely, because um, you do have two resources here, you've got two unicenters, um, maybe go to them and then they can find ways to connect you more and more to different domains. I'm Irma Ranieri, the Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, but I'm also the President of IPA. Um, you, you probably need to stand here because I want everyone to give you a round of applause. The one thing I have to say, and I'll draw some things out, but, but you are an absolute inspiration. The fact that you left um, all that money um, and uh, are working to purpose and actually thinking about the complexities of the system that you're working within and finding ways for people to actually self-determine is, is amazing and we need more people, younger people, um, to be doing that. So please, a round of applause for the work that Kat does. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> but there's more. Um, it's really hard to do what you're, you're doing. The systems that you talked to, I love the idea about the two financial systems. We can do that in Treasury. Come on, public service. Not. Um, 
Uh, and look, I've, I've worked within that system and I hear everything that people have actually said. Um, and we try to deal with wicked problems and there are a lot of people in this room that I've worked really closely with. A lot of us actually go into public service, go in it because we're not going to get that rich, um, but we do go in it because we're driven by our purpose. We're there because we are public servants who want to serve something. I truly believe, um, and a lot of the work that we do in the public service, is that every single individual has that purpose. And the ones that don't were probably in an environment where they only could see hopelessness. And it is our job to make sure, in the way that you've described it, that they get that support to actually see some sort of level um, of control over where they want to go and how we kind of give them the leg up or the hand up, uh, but not the hand out. So people need to actually self-determine, and this is what I love about what you've just done, what you're talking about, and what you're what you're doing. Um, and I believe we can actually find another way. And for the students here from Scotch College, um, the younger generation believe in doing something different and be the leaders that will actually look at that different paradigm. Um, show me your character is about how you show up every day. We are all leaders and how we behave each and every day is the model for the future generation. So we can choose to behave in a particular way or we can choose to actually um, not be ethical, choose to do things with money that is ab about self-gain or we can choose to share it. So that's the message I got from you and I think that we should walk out of here today making a choice that we will make some little difference in how we might do that because we're all leaders in our own area. Um, I certainly believe in that. So thank you very much. Thank you. And another round of applause. I'm going to do the final wrap up. Uh, thank you to the Senior Management Council of the State Government who support IPA, Flinders University and University of Adelaide for their ongoing support, support of IPA and of course the Don Dunstan Foundation. I'd like to thank the teams of both IPA and the Don Dunstan Foundation for overseeing the delivery of this annual forum. Thank you guys again. Um, Please go on to the IPA website for more forums. Um, we have On the Couch series. The next one is with our Chief Executive of Attorney General's Department um, on 13th of November and On the Couch with uh, Dr Christopher McGowan, uh, Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Wellbeing. We've been on a recruitment drive over the last six months. Um, that's on the 20th of, of November. Um, I think everyone's here today because you really wanted to hear I guess, an inspiration and what we can do things differently. So um, I know that we're all the right people in the room because we knew that we'd get something out of it. Uh, we'd like to get some feedback. I think we should have more of these events. And I want to, to thank you for being here and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much.